All right, friends, we're going to get to it, and today we will be talking about event management. Event management uh, does have a colorful history going back to the barnstorming days of different professional sports events like uh, basketball, football, and baseball. But today, really, uh, when we talk about sport event management, what we're discussing is any function or all functions related to the planning, implementation, and evaluation of a sport event. So if this kind of takes us back to the uh, managerial aspects of sport management that we discussed uh, earlier in the semester. And in order to have a well-rounded and properly planned, executed, and, and evaluated event, this requires uh, us as sport managers to draw from different areas, whether it's finance, uh, risk management, uh, tournament operations, volunteer management, marketing, hospitality, branding, sponsorship, etc. We all need all of these skills in order to execute an effective event from conception to evaluation. In terms of the emergence of sport management and sp uh, sport marketing firms, uh, we've seen over the years as sport management as a field and as events have become more and more popular, a proliferation of different types of sport agencies with different uh, functions in mind. So different agencies, and an agency is just a, a, a private organization that has been created for the purpose uh, of whether it's um, acting on behalf of a sport property. Uh, so you could have a person, a company, or an event um, that is the uh, client. And the agencies really have expanded to incorporate just a myriad of different functions that go beyond this basic aspect of client representation, whether it's marketing or actual development and management of events. Uh, we've seen this with what's, uh, you know, X Games and the Do, uh, the Do Games and different sorts of um, events that have uh, barnstormed themselves going from city to city, uh, putting on their events, the, the Red Bull series or different sort of non-traditional sport, uh, sport concepts and sport events. So the agency functions really run quite a, a, a wide berth. Um, and this has really been a carve-out for um, the sport management field to uh, provide different benefits to sports organizations, whether it's uh, market research, where the private agency could provide, could uh, send out uh, mail surveys or conduct focus groups uh, or do surveys on site during the event to help to uh, provide useful information to their client about the benefits and impact that their um, event is having. And this goes beyond just basic client representation, which, which we have seen um, negotiation of contracts on behalf of the client or marketing, hospitality, etc. So really, the textbook introduces us to three different types of agencies. And the full service is the type of agency that is a large conglomerate or a large business uh, that performs just a complete one-stop shop of functions for the client. And we see uh, uh, sort of well-known entities like IMG and Octagon who have really cornered uh, the market here, although there's others, um, but IMG and Octagon are traditionally are buying up other competitors. For example, IMG at this point really is more than 3,500 employees that are operating in different um, countries throughout the world. And they have not only famous um, athletes like Peyton Manning or Venus Williams, but they might have famous coaches uh, as part of their uh, stable of clients. They might have their own uh, events that they have developed for the purposes of putting on for ticketing revenue, for uh broadcast revenue for branding for other sorts of uh, revenue generating purposes. But then we might have the specialized agencies that really limit their scope to specific services or specific types of clients. So you might have a firm that just does uh, advising of corporations and how to maximize their sponsorship opportunities like Red Man uh, uh, Mandarin. 
Uh, and then finally, there's the in-house agencies like MasterCard or FedEx uh, or these large corporations that uh, devote uh, su uh, significant amounts of money to trying to promote their company through different sport opportunities that match sort of the brand that the organization, the, the corporation has developed. So the goal of these in-house agencies, for example, might be to try to find sponsorship opportunities that match what what they think um, is their, uh, their brand or sort of the best investment of their money. There are different functions uh, in terms of uh, sport event management, and nearly all, uh, all managers really are overseeing these different functional areas, and each of them are critical. So it starts with the planning stage, which is the finance and budgeting and risk management. And then once you've gotten those nuts and bolts out of the way, it will move towards, well, how are we going to execute that, uh, this, this event? What is the uh, operational uh, standpoint? So once we've actually planned it, how are we going to implement it? So um, it's part of tournament operations, we would have registration and dealing with volunteer management and then event marketing and then sort of the wrap up, which goes back to event ops and then sort of re uh, circling back and evaluating the, those, um, you know, how the event went. And in terms of finance and budgeting, these are critical because the budgeting process really is the is attempting to tell the organization what sort of revenues and expenditures will be associated with this event and it's important in order to be able to plan out a proper event to know what sort of financial expectations are going to be a part of this event so if a tennis tournament is being created for the first time and they don't know what sort of costs will be associated with securing the venue, uh, hiring employees, hiring insurance, getting office equipment up and running, um, and they miscalculate, then it's going to sink their ability to actually put on the tournament uh, because they weren't able to have the, the right amount of funds right off the bat. So budgeting is incredibly important and the financial, finance aspect is also very important. So Oftentimes, zero-based budgeting that, that the textbook talks about is important because it helps the event to evaluate the financial considerations and activities associated with that event as if it was occurring for the first time. So previous budgets and revenues are going to be ignored, and the organization would start off with zero cash flow, meaning that they it will let the organization know what amount of money is going to be necessary in order to pay the expenses at the predetermined times during the accounting cycle. And this plan must be carefully crafted because an organization does not want to avoid uh, financial shortfalls. If the organization does not have the cash, so if you, as the tennis organization, don't have the money to pay your employees or pay your vendors, then that's going to prevent you from being able to plan and execute your event, which is going to sink the event. Cash flow uh, budgeting is very important because it helps to account for the timing and the receipt of sort of the, 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 the expenditures that are going to be flowing out of your organization and hopefully account for the revenues that will be flowing into the organization. So in terms of finance and budgeting, it's important to understand the time period that's necessary to plan, organize, and operate the event. And it could be something just as a few months or a few years. So understanding the budgeting process is incredibly important. Once you've established that budgeting process, then the second major functional area is event management uh, concerning risk and risk management. And really, if we remember back from the legal unit, 
risk management is the process of protecting the organization from not just potential liability, but anything that can go wrong with your event and with your organization and lead to a loss of finances or equipment or goodwill or the loss of sort of your position within the market. So it's not just potential. We uh, did not uh, make the property safe for fans to be on the premise and someone twisted their ankle and now they're suing. That Yes, that's one type of loss, but if you lose goodwill, if you have a scandal that's been that, that's unfolding, that also is a risk that can damage your organization from not just a financial standpoint, from, but from a goodwill standpoint, how the public views your organization. So risk management essentially protects your organization from anything whatsoever that can lead to a loss of revenues or a loss of customers. It's not just liability. And as part of this risk management process, the text talks about the importance of making sure that the organization uses waivers and releases of liability. And these are just contracts. These are legal mechanisms that are going to um, be a contract between the organization and could be people coming onto the premise to view the event or to participate in the event. And it's a form that is signed by usually participants and volunteers that that where the the participants or volunteers promises that they will not sue in the event that they are subject to something like negligence or that if the participant or volunteer hurts themselves so it's a release of liability and the waiver doesn't absolve organizations from all responsibilities and all liabilities from the event it's not an absolute bar but it might be limited to certain aspects such as negligence. Um, in, in waivers and releases of liability are a creature of contract, and some states, by virtue of laws on the books, will accept this sort of mechanism as a defense against things like negligence. Um, but some states will not. Some states will say, well, that this is just a piece of paper, and it needs to be interpreted in the context of everything else that happened uh, with the incident. So, it's important for organizations and, and events to have multiple types of mechanisms that will protect an, them uh, in a more comprehensive manner. So let's say that you run a sports facility that, that does indoor soccer. Well, you might have an adult soccer league where you have participants sign off on a release of liability, but it's also important for the organization to purchase insurance because insurance is another sort of contract between the organization and an insurance company that says, okay, the organization, the, the, the business is going to pay monthly premiums to the insurance company. And then in exchange for those monthly premiums, the insurance company will step in and help um, with paying any sort of financial losses that occur if a stated event happens. So if the roof caves in of the soccer facility or if someone suffers a major injury playing in the soccer uh, game and, and they suffer uh, a, a major, major injury and they sue the uh, facility. So those are just two separate examples. Um, a popular sort of uh, way for... Uh, um, for organizations to help with the risk mitigation and risk management aspects is also to include those, that language of, uh, of the waiver in release of liability or any sort of other cautionary language on the ticket itself. So um, there would be maybe if you get an e-ticket or if you get a, a hard copy ticket, there might be some language in that, in that ticket, in that fine print that says in exchange for buying the ticket and coming into the, into the premise of the facility or coming to the tournament that you agree to waive your right to sue in the event of X, Y, and Z happening. So that's one way that an uh, organization could potentially help to mitigate risk uh, from a risk management standpoint. In addition, um, issues of risk management are becoming increasingly more important in the era of um, Increased, um, increased at focus, uh, attention that's being given uh, to these large-scale events that might be potential um, uh, targets for terrorism or, or for violence. So after 
the horrific uh, attacks of September 11th, um, premises have um, any sort of venue or event has been heightened in terms of the presence of the risk of terrorist attacks. So now, especially with the professional leagues or even major events, uh, their security personnel are, are in contact with the government to make sure that they uh, that these events are being advised of the potential risk. And we saw an example of this where in 2013, several individuals um, set off bombs during the Boston Marathon, which led, led to uh, just major devastation uh, in terms of lives that were lost and then many, many, many injuries, hun uh, hundreds of people. Um, and these were just predominantly people who were there to watch the event. And so this has put an increased focus on the need, the, the legal duty, um, if an organization is on notice that their event could be a target for uh, terrorist activity or violence, to hire more security and to fund more, uh, to, to put in more pr provisions for security. So we've seen uh, a movement towards using metal detectors, increased security personnel, having working hand in hand with police, etc. Um, and the textbook rep mentions the difficulties of this because oftentimes these events work on shoestring budgets and they might not have the money to hire well-trained security or enough adequate security. So this creates a real issue for those in the business of putting on events. So if we were going to um, actually walk through the different ways in which um, an event operates, so we did the, the, the initial sort of planning process, we did the finance and budgeting, and then we did the, the legal and risk management, but now we get to the operations, the execution. And so it's helpful to take, a, when we're going through the nuts and bolts of the event, to talk about pre-event, actual event, and the post-event. So we're going to walk through this using a, a professional golf tournament as the example of how this gets done. So the pre-event elements of, a, uh, if, uh, of, an, of an event, such as a golf tournament, is pretty expansive. Uh, you look down the list, and these are all activities that determine uh, how an event will be organized and what are the goals. And all of the things, the big picture sort of planning should, of course, be done pre-event. So here we're going to look at, well, what venue do we actually want to use? What's the layout? What sort of facility is proper? Can it accommodate the, the necessary equipment? What is the equipment that we need um, in terms of golf? Are we going to need uh, heavy-duty equipment? Are we going to be needing to accommodate television, uh, grandstands for people who are going to be sitting uh, in different strategic parts of the golf course? Uh, where are those best sight lines? Uh, where are we going to per be able to per accommodate the needs of those who that were, uh, are going to sponsor the event? Um, are there going to be sort of collateral or, or ancillary activities that are going to be a part of the main event? So are we going to have a week or so of smaller events that are on at the golf course uh, that promote and lead up to the actual golf course tournament? Where will signage be? Uh, food and beverage consideration, where's the merge table going to be, where we're going to host the media, uh, what sort of promotional activities are going to be as part of this whole event, transportation, security, um, just running the gambit. How are we going to accommodate for security issues and then the ADA, which we talked about, crowd control. So this is just really expansive. So all of these different elements need to be accounted for um, before you even start to execute the event um, because without proper training for all of this, or not proper training, sorry, proper considerations of all these, um, that this is going to lead to a potential sloppy event and a lot of issues during the execution. But once all of these considerations have been provided for, then the actual event can be executed. And an important element of a, a well-executed event is making sure that everyone is on script. So a script is, as the text says, a specific detailed minute-by-minute -minute schedule of activities 
throughout the event. So it's going to make sure that everyone who um, is taking part in the material aspects of this event has a copy of the script and that way they know when and where the events are going to take place and sort of how the operational needs are going to be um, addressed and taken care of for. And each person should it should the script should say who's in charge of each activity so that there's accountability. Once an event is actually um, uh, occurs, so you have your golf tournament, you've set you have your uh, proper um, resources that were allotted. Um, the the golfers uh, were taken care of. Sponsors were taken care of. There is hospitality. There is activation. Uh, it was broadcast, etc. Then we're going to tear down the event, and so this is the post uh, post event tournament operations where you're going to be doing the tear down. Equipment and supplies are going to be stored. The facility is going to be rehabbed, whether it's trash pickup or dealing with uh, the sodding issues. <clears throat> and then the financial accounting uh, will will come back into play about well, how how did we do with our expenses, um, and then sort of circling back with sponsors, uh, people such as volunteers, other partners to make sure that they know that uh, they are appreciated and those relationships are taken care of. And then there might be a, an end of the event recap meeting um, with the different stakeholders involved in this event. In a, as part of ops, um, re registration is important. And registration is just registering uh, the participants, the sponsors, anyone who's coming to the event, uh, the, the uh, spectators. And you're trying to capture all of that information. And it's important to have a proper registration system so you're making a good impression with the athletes or the participants or the clientele. Because, of course, as the cliche goes, um, you only have one, ch one chance to make a good first impression. So... You need to ask yourself from this registration standpoint, what information is important to be collected and distributed uh, at these different points of registration? So um, the question becomes, how are you, what are you capturing? What sort of information are you capturing from these individuals? Um, are you going to make them, have them sign the waiver forms right off the bat uh, at that registration uh, booth, the registration desk? Um, to help mitigate liability is if there's alcohol that's going to be uh, distributed or for sale um, make sure that they are properly authenticated so that they are of legal drinking age um, how is the event schedule going to be distributed are you going to be giving it to them right there um, or other ways it's going to be available through an app and then registration fees, collecting the fees. How is that going to be accomplished? Is it going to be uh, cashless? Is it going to be through um, using the smartphone? Is it going to be through that a traditional register? And then how are you going to account for new registrants uh, to wa walking up for an event such as a, a marathon or a race? And then how are you going to accommodate those who have gone through pre-registration? Are you going to even have pre-registration? So these different considerations are important. And... Whether or not you use a computer-based system, whether it's through your uh, an iPad or a computer uh, or a cell phone, or is it going to be manual somehow? So these are all important first, uh, uh, all important considerations for registration. Another important aspect from an operation standpoint is the volunteer management. So how are we going to deal with volunteers? Uh, volunteers are incredibly important as sport managers and events continue to work on these shoestring budgets, like I said. Um, how are we going to account for uh, supervising them on a day-to-day -day because an organization can still have liability for a volunteer even if they're not being paid? Uh, and here, it's really volunteer management is divided up into two principal areas. The first one is working with the event organizers and staff to identify what are the needs for that event and how are volunteers going to be allotted, you know, where are they going to go to fulfill those needs. And then second, the uh, trying to recruit volunteers, train them, and manage them appropriate. So these are two incredibly important areas 
uh, that event managers are increasingly needing to get creative in order to uh, recruit sufficient volunteers and have them trained and manage them properly. So what makes people want to volunteer for events? How can we keep our volunteers happy? And really it comes down to, you know, giving them maybe uh, unique opportunities uh, for uh, in exchange for volunteering. Maybe you give them unique experiences to get a glimpse of behind sort of the, the, the curtain of the event, or maybe give them free food or free uh, sort of clothing or something, free uh, exclusive access. So th these would be examples where um, it would be helpful in terms of recruiting volunteers. Th another important aspect of the, uh, the event market or the event management functions are marketing. So we've, come, we've talked about marketing in the past, so this should be something that, um, that is uh, not a foreign concept. So it's marketing and promotions, very similar. All, th all of the uh, activities dedicated to um, maximizing exposure for your event and driving revenues. And so that could be done through a litany of ways. So uh, it, when we talk about the integrated marketing approach, that really is a manner of marketing that entails a long-term strategic planning to manage the functional areas that are consistent with your event. So sponsorship, advertising, public relations, hospitality, ticket sales, broadcasting, all of these different aspects are uh, designed from a long-term perspective to maximize revenues and maximize the, 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 the popularity or, or the, the, the maximize the amount of people that know about your event. So in, first right off the bat, corporate sponsorship is very important because it draws in other partners from the surrounding community or other uh, other corporations that can help you in generating revenue for the event and then uh, publicizing the event. And an increase in the number of events that are now being put on by sport managers has also led to an increase in competition for sponsors. So with the more events that are out there, the more likely that there's going to be competition. Um, however, because of the big dollars that are out there, um, events have been increasingly uh, been incorporating sponsorships as a core strategy of their event. And we've even seen this uh, with uh, huge companies and organizations like the International Olympic Committee, which actually um, sponsorship is a just a tremendous component of their of their of their business plan to the point that they've actually brought in they've created their own sponsorship department of the ILC as opposed to relying on sort of outside companies to help them out with that outside agencies <clears throat> and as we see just how uh, uh, how large of a of a, of a percentage that uh, sponsorship can be just look at some of these dollars that have been spent from 2013, which probably means that it's over, these these numbers have significantly increased in light of our um, bounce back from the Great Recession and the increased sort of revenue generation uh, of these uh, of these opportunities. So, in addition to sponsorship, we also have advertising and public relations, which is a portion of uh, of these different um, events. Um, advertising expenses are something that an event has to pay, so that's something that they should account for in budgeting. And advertising has uh, been accomplished either through e uh, media sponsors or trying to find corporate sponsors uh, to help with advertising. And sponsorships have also been, uh, or advertising has been helped through in-kind sponsorships, which are where the event provides uh, intrinsic benefits in exchange for a specified amount of free advertising space. So um, a sponsor might give their product or their service 
to the event for free in exchange for advertising space. And also, uh, the organization might help with public relations. Uh, so that could be um, a, a uh, tournament, a golf tournament, working with CBS to help co-publicize uh, that event. There's also hospitality opportunities, and that's really about providing a satisfactory or, or positive experience for anyone who's a stakeholder in the event. So that could be the media, sponsors, participants, even the spectators, the VIPs. And this is a way to help to improve their loyalty. Um, so it might be when you go on to the, 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 the golf uh, premise, you go on to the... the, the, the um, the, you get out of the building and go out towards the course. There might be a strategically placed around the 18 holes, um, different sorts of huts and, and, and uh, sponsorship uh, uh, or different hospitality areas where a variety of stakeholders can get access to different opportunities, food, drink, uh, unique, unique, unique experiences. And this is a, a great way to reward and build relationships with uh, an organization's customers or try to create, create new customers or reward your, your sponsors and even reward employees. So hospitality is definitely important and it's in, in, in it, one of the common functions of a sports agency. Ticketing, of course, is also important. However, with these uh, events uh, that are smaller or a smaller size than, say, uh, a, a large-scale sporting event like a football game played in a major league college stadium that very well might offer over 100,000 uh, people uh, the ability to watch. Um, these, uh, ev uh, these events might be a lot smaller, a lot more intimate. So the ability to maximize revenues through ticket sales is not always there. Um, the ability to charge admission to these uh, events is really dependent on how easily uh, those controlling the event, like the event manager, can control entry and access. Because if people can come and go as they please, and it's a very porous sort of premise with many entry and access points, then people are probably less likely to uh, to pay, and there's going to be... Um, less revenues. But of course, different technologies like mobile apps can help with the ease of collecting ticket sales and make uh, increase the potential profit margin. Uh, some events have broadcasting. However, these again are, are usually larger events like uh, major uh, golf events or major sort of um, uh, major tours uh, that have been created by sp uh, sport agencies for the purpose of maximizing revenue, and they might have certain relationships with, um, with traditional broadcast networks. But of course, um, an organization now has the ability to create their own broadcast production and can then sell their own rights to other, uh, to directly to consumers, by allowing them to pay a subscription to watch the event online or maybe to distribute it to different television networks. So um, it, if the, the broadcast um, is something that's not really attractive for large audiences, the organization, the management, the, the event itself can actually um, do that, uh, although there's a cost for that. So also a sports organization or a event an event itself uh, can invest in its own website development, which can be helpful with conveying important information about your event uh, or potentially have the ability to help with broadcasting the event uh, online if that's, if that's something that's important to the event. However, um, the event also can have different licensing and merchandising opportunities, and that's uh, sale of items that display an event's name or logo. Uh, however, this usually isn't going to be very beneficial unless it's a large, well-known uh, event. Um, if the event is just getting started, it might not be the best idea to sink large large dollars into dealing, uh, uh, developing a licensing and merchandising program. However, there are benefits, of course, because those that licensing and merchandising helps to be a good brand ambassador 
for your event uh, and can help to build name rec recognition. But there's also costs with getting that off the ground. And then finally, um, some events are not for, not for profit, and you could, uh, as part of your event execution, uh, add fundraising as a way to generate revenue. But um, most often, not for not for profit events center around raising money for charitable causes, cause cause related marketing, coaches versus cancer, uh, basketball tournament that happens annually. And so this cause-related marketing efforts uh, can also be done by corporations um, in a way that would help with fundraising, but sometimes it's nonprofits and sometimes it's a corporation. So I hope that this chapter was beneficial, and I hope that uh, you guys got some good information out of it, and I look forward to continuing the conversation offline.